Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Well, good morning. This is Stan coming to you from Gainesville, and today we are discussing AI, super technology, too many colors, and PB and J, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. How long and is it? <laughs> it's long, baby. <laughs> and uh, you, if you don't know already, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. And again, we have Stan on with us. Three weeks in a row, Stan. What the heck happened to me? <laughs> Am I getting paid now? No. Nope. I haven't gotten a check yet. <laughs> the, the original trio of insanity uh, back with you. Actually, our good, good friend bro and brother, Zach, is still recovering from COVID. Uh, he's got that eternal cough that many of us have suffered from the last several months, usually after you're done with Get it. Get rid of that thing, Zach, please. Yeah, man. You know, it's it's a shame. It's horrible. But that cough is a pain. Let me tell you, I had it for like six weeks and then it finally went away. Uh, finally. So I feel so much better now. But send it packing. Send it packing. Yeah, I sent it packing. Send yeah, it it's packing. Gone. It's gone. It's gone. Good. So anyway, welcome, everyone, to episode 278. And we've got a really big shoe for you today. OK, Ed. <laughs> we, got, Ed. we got Topo Gigio. <laughs> On the show, <laughs> your the favorite sh mouse. Who's the big shoe? He's a really big show. And then we have like the uh, Lawrence Welk singers, and uh, we have several other people. But let's I get started bubbles. with news. We have news? We have news. Can you, you know? put that sound and effect I, in for me, please? I like that sound effect with the typing. <laughs> yes, it's there. You okay. just heard it. De -de 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 -de. Oh, there it goes. There it yeah, goes. Yeah, there it is. So today, uh, we, we actually, yesterday, because we're actually taping on. Wait, wait, this is Tuesday or Wednesday? It's Tuesday. So yesterday... Already? <laughs> yesterday was Hal Binkley's uh, birthday. And there were a lot of lovely wishes uh, on Facebook and Instagram celebrating Hal's memory. And there was this terrific one that I found that uh, you might, probably everybody has seen it. But they actually surprised him on his birthday a few years ago. He was doing some Broadway show, and they all started singing, and it's really lovely. Uh, so that's, that's great. Uh, speaking of Hal Binkley, there is a new Hal Binkley Fellowship that has been uh, put together by the good people at the Gilbert Hemsley Lighting Internship and Portfolio Review that Mark Stanley and a bunch of great people do for Gilbert. It's terrific because they're now asking people to go ahead and donate to it. And I've donated. I know a lot of my friends have donated. And uh, even any money that you can spare would be terrific because it all goes to a good cause. So we have a link on the Light Talk Facebook group page. So if you are interested, we urge you to do it. I know that there's a donor that once they hit $10,000, this donor will match it. So that's wonderful. That's a great, great thing. So please, please contribute if you can. Uh, what other news do we have in the lighting industry this week? Hmm. I think that's it. <laughs> we can make something up like we usually do. No, we never make anything up I will have new show. news for you next week. So I am teasing upcoming news. Ooh. Oh, okay. Did we? Wow, a tease. Yeah, okay. We have some, we have some, you know, we have some new products in development, but we can't release them because we don't, know, well, we don't know if they're just prototypes and they might fail, in which case we wouldn't bring them to market. But in the event that the product succeeds, you may see some new Light Talk products. I mean, fail like the Titanic or the Hindenburg <laughs> or fail like a souffle. What kind of failure uh, are we like talking about? Souffle. No, 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 no. When we fail, we go down we in like flames, baby. We like to go baby. big. Either it succeeds <laughs> or it really flops. We like, go big. <laughs> you know, and we don't know. You know, it, we're entrepreneurial. And so you have to, you know, most entrepreneurial ventures fail. This one, I thought it was going to be dead after three weeks. You know, look ah. what happened. Now I'm back six years later. <laughs> Anyway, let's get started with the show. Steve has our first question. Yes, it comes from Rose in South Carolina. And she says, can you discuss 
tech that is changing way too fast and what that means for schools and design programs. So all of a sudden you buy something on Monday and next Thursday you go, why did I buy that? Why didn't I wait? I think schools are trying to decide what to buy and if they should buy anything or if in six months there's going to be a new LED or a new moving light or a new console. I think it's difficult for students and teachers. You know, what do I teach? What do I learn? Uh, what skills do I need? Is this program with us or, or not going to be with us? What's next in line? So everyone, I think uh, schools are trying to figure out how to be uh, uh, on the cutting edge with uh, limited budgets. And I think students are desperate to figure out if there's going to be a place for them in the job market in three years or if what they're uh, doing is not going to be relevant in three years. I think in regards to design, and we've talked about this a little bit, I think the design principles don't change. But I think technology changes really fast. So, you know, a few years ago, um, if you could run an ETC console, then you had it made. That was, that's all you needed to know. It had been around forever. It was, it was the standard of the industry. It still is a very strong console. But all of a sudden, there are three or four consoles out there now that are challenging that dominance in the market. And who knows? Who knows what's being developed? What do you guys think? Uh, should Rose be worried about what she's learning in regards to tech? Wow. Boy, that is a, it's a tough one. Yeah, I think, I think you want to have a, a mentality where the plasticity of your brain to be able to adapt to changes in technology is sort of important. I've seen people who literally like, I, okay, let me use a terrible example. You know, there are still people who have flip phones. Oh, and they, okay. Really? I beg yes. your pardon. <laughs> yes. There are people who, a friend of mine, I'm not going to mention names. But his initials are. Uh, no, not going to do that. But, you know, has a flip phone and just refuses to update to any kind of other type of phone. I'll give you two examples. And they, they had an experience, let's just say that was negative, and they feel like they can't adapt, and therefore they decided to stop. I think that's bad. And then on, on, I know someone else in my family who never embraced or was in a situation, let's say not for no fault of their own, to actually start using technology, particularly what we say information technology, phones, computers, whatnot, and now is trying to catch up after eight, 10 years of not engaging. And that's such a steep climb that they can't do it, even though they want to. And they blame the device. And the device is stupid. It's not the device, it's you. You're 10, you, you haven't built up the the, the prerequisite basics to kind of deal with that. So you can fall behind quickly. So I think to, to Rose, I think you do, if you, if you stop, you know, rust never sleeps. And with technology, I think you've got to, you don't have to be an expert in everything, but you can't just say, I'm not going to learn anything new anymore, or you will get buried by the wave. That's my take. Whenever you're working in a high technology industry, like lighting, you have to stay current and you have to learn as much technology as possible. And it is kind of daunting in our industry because it does not stay the same. It's constantly moving. It's an artistic uh, industry. Therefore, artists are always going to be asking for more, more power, more colors, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, more power as far as versatility of programming, uh, smaller fixtures, they're going to be asking for all that crazy stuff. And new technology is going to be, you know, supporting that. So we've got to learn that, you know? I mean, it's like black tracks. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of changed a lot, right? And we need to know that so we can certainly, so that we become better designers. And also for people who are in education, we can expose our students to it. And we could like tell our students about it and they could learn it. So all that is really super, super important. In regards to what David was saying about, about staying up, it, I think the real challenge is, even if you are predisposed to learning technology, there's just so many right now that you have to sort of choose which, or well, make a guess as to which one's going to survive 
and be around in five years and which one isn't. And you, since you mentioned black tracks, you know, I hitched my wagon to cast software years ago and people say, Oh, that one, uh, now you got to move. And they, and they managed to stay relevant and now they are black tracks. And so, so you got to have to pick because I think the brain's only so big. So you have to make some good hunches about which ones to stay with and which ones are, are a flash in the pan. Well, it's like playing the stock market. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you get this new company that has this great product and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to throw $100,000 into that company. And then all of a sudden the technology doesn't hold. Since you took it over to, to stocks, it's like when you read up on that, like, remember Atari? Oh, I loved okay, Atari. So Atari, Atari was Atari. Good, could could have been the Mac. So if you you know, if there was there might have been a dozen great computer companies at that time. Yeah, Commodore. You, yeah, Commodore. And you pick one, and you hope you don't really know if you're a venture capitalist. You maybe you put chips on all of them because you really don't know which one's going to be the winner in that space. And so the same thing here. It's like which I would just say be thoughtful and use your intuition and do your best research as to which things you're going to give your time to, to stay with. And uh, yeah, right about black tracks, we're going to have it here this fall. I won't be around. I'll be on sabbatical, but we'll be using black tracks for our follow spots for our fall musical so that the students get the exposure. Of course. As That's David great. Said. Yeah. It's great. But who knows? Maybe black tracks will be replaced by somebody else. You just don't, we don't know the future. So Jeremy from Belfast writes, when I am working on the color palette of my show, how do I start? There are millions of colors and it all gets jumbled in my brain. Sometimes I just want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry, Jeremy. Been there, there, Jeremy. Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> I cry all the time when I'm like these shows. People say, what's wrong with him? He goes, oh, no, he's just trying to decide between, uh, you know, a lavender and a, <laughs> a green blue. <laughs> so he's, he says, Crying over color. Crying over color. All right. Okay. So here's the problem. And actually, we were talking about this last week with Beverly Emmons. And for those who haven't heard that interview, please listen to it. Uh, that was episode 277. And uh, I had asked Beverly what she likes about Broadway and what she doesn't like about Broadway and the lighting, how lighting has changed on Broadway. And she said... Too many colors. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with the, with the technology, with LED technology. Because, you know, with an LED fixture, you can go to almost any color you want instantly. So then you have like this unbelievable variety of color. And unfortunately, as Beverly was talking about, people sometimes use it in very gaudy ways. Uh, very abrupt ways, you know, they go to, when, when they go to like something a little warmer, they go red, you know, <laughs> can, it, can you cool it down? Sure. Let's throw in some green blue. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. Cool it down. I mean, you know, when you're talking about uh, like Lee 202, <laughs> 201, that's what I'm talking about. And she was talking about, she comes from a time and actually the three of us come from a time where all we had were gels. And most of us were using very subtle colors. Now, you'd use something really strong for if you want a really strong statement, obviously. But, you know, you had to change it with gel. And once you put that gel in that light, unless you're doing a dance show, you can reach a shin kick or a head high, that gel stays in that light for the whole show. It costs so money to change it. It costs money. So that too, that's a whole nother story. But uh, nowadays, you can have any color you want. Unfortunately, as Beverly also said, you still can't get that 201 or 200. I was working, you know, this summer with some really sophisticated LED fixtures, and I could not get that color. There are advantages to LED, and there are disadvantages to LED. So, to answer your question, how do I start? You have to decide, first of all, and we've talked about this all the way back to, from season one, if you want to work in a red palette or a green palette, and that could go by scene by scene, or it could be act, or it could be the entire show, depending on how complex the lighting is for that show. So if you want to go with a red palette, then you immediately know that all your blues are going to have a little bit of red in it, right? And you're not going to be using anything with green in them. 
unless you want to do something really powerful and strong and, and really make a statement. But most everything is going to be pinks. They're going to be lavenders, that sort of thing. So once you get that, then everything's going to be unified. Now, another thing that Beverly talked about was that you could even start with clear light. And this is what I do a lot. I start with clear light. And I'm going to just talk about tungsten world now. So we're in like 3200 Kelvin type of uh, color. And then just do tints to take that clear light into and out of certain color palettes. So that's another thing that you could do. But don't think that just because you can make 8 million colors come out of a light, that you have to use 8 million colors. Think like you're choosing a gel for that moment. All right. And if you choose a gel and you have a palette of light that's lighting that scene, if you're on the green palette side or you're on the red palette side, just choose one of them. <laughs> and you will know. I'll tell you what will answer that question for you very easily. Guys, do you know? The one thing that will answer the color, whether you should be on the green palette or a red palette. I'm testing my, my brother's. I think my brothers have fallen asleep. Wait, I, didn't know, I didn't know there was going to be a test today. I would have studied. What's the one element of stage design that will guide you on whether you should be in a green palette or a red palette? The set. Well, the set is an important element. Absolutely. But, what's <laughs> even, but, but what else? Well, I would, I, would think the, I would think the people. Yeah, the people and the costumes. Well, costumes, right? yeah. If Everybody, someone's coming yeah. out in a red dress, you better not be in a green palette. Yeah, the palette of the, sh the, palette of the other designers, right? What, yeah. if, you're, what if you're doing old Calcutta? Red or, red or <laughs> then, green then palette? Then it's skin tones. Then you, then you do everything at 3200 Kelvin. And everything, everyone yeah, looks marvelous. I don't know. Marvelous. That could be, it could be a you range of people these days. What's that? No, 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 no. You do skin tones. And let me tell you about skin tones. The best way to light skin tones is with no color light with 3,200 Kelvin, beautiful, um, beautiful incandescent lights. Uh, that is the best way to light skin tones. You know, probably at around 70, 60% because it gets even a little warmer and it pulls well, out. You, you put some light correction, a CTB in there, you have a, a, a nice range. Or in contrast with open with yeah, some CTBs. Absolutely, like. absolutely. But it depends on the skin tones. So, but it, it really it does. It also depends on the, on the uh, costumes. So and it, do your homework. Okay, what's, what's around them. <laughs> yeah. And what's around them. Yeah. And of course, the set too, as, as Stan said. You've got me intrigued now. Going back to the 201, how did you guys try to mix to it with the ion? The relativity of color. What else is around it? And that's how we solved the problem. I changed the color around it so it appeared to be 201, but it wasn't 201. I'll tell you that right now. That's how I, I did it. You know, you know, it's funny because I saw that review of that show, and the reviewer <laughs> said, that David, that David Jockey, he, um, he tried to fool me with, with an imitation 201, but this reporter saw through it. He changed everything else on the stage so it would look blue. Yeah, not, I, uh, not me, buddy. Okay, I have a technique I'd like to offer for this about too many colors that I think that that I think young students could benefit from. My, the young students are very good at coming up with um, artwork or other visual research references for them for a scene or a show, and I think that's really great. And I discovered that Adobe has this very cool tool which will let you import an image, whatever that image might be. And then you can take samples of different portions of that image and create palettes. And within the algorithms, this kind of leads into our LTA later, right? Um, you can say, I want an analogous palette or I want a contrasting palette based on these colors. And as you select them, it puts them in a band or it will put them into a gradient. So you can see how one flows into another. So they are you're seeing those colors relative to each other, which I think is David's really important point. So I have found that tool to be extraordinarily useful, and I've used it where I will, let's say I'm doing a, a venue and we're going to do, I don't know, it's, um, it's St. Patrick's Day or it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month or whatever, and I want a, sort of a whole world of pink or I want a whole world of green, and I'll find some research that I like that has this palette, and then I'll go into it with the Adobe tool and select portions of it 
I like the way they look together. And you've got quite a lot of tools to tweak it and then save it as a gradient and then hand it to a programmer and say, this is the world I want you to be in. And it's it worked remarkably well to kind of restrict the palette so you're not all over the place. And it comes from something that I've chosen that I think relates to the scene or the moment or whatever it is I'm trying to make. So I highly recommend that Adobe palette tool for those of you out there. Okay. I like your idea. <laughs> cool. I love affirmation. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to cry anymore, and neither does Jeremy. No, I think it's a lot of fun. I've spent a lot of time in that thing, and I'll pick, like, for example, I have a whole collection of, of modern Dutch-Danish art from when I was in Amsterdam, and I would pop those in. And oftentimes they were very, a very broad palette, but I go, oh, I like that, or I like how that goes together. And that sort of, it's not like gel colors, but it sort of puts me into a range of the world I want to be in, um, and, and it lets me see them next to each other, right? And then I can, it's really a very cool tool. Check it out, everybody, the Adobe Palette Tool. Well, Scott in Orlando asks, I have been told that there is a high level of LED light engine failure. Is this true? Should I really be afraid of LEDs? I'm scared to death of LEDs. I just told you a story why I couldn't get 201. Yeah, he couldn't get 201 <laughs> for the life of him. But Steve had the solution. So, you know, wow. I don't, I've not seen any data uh, or in any of the trade publications. I would think that that would be big news and that the Lumen Brothers would have heard about it, that there is, a, a, you know, an excessive amount of, I certainly, I know about LED degradation across time, LM30, I think, or LM something. There's an IES document that actually shows you. And I, and I do think the 50,000 hour thing is a laboratory number, not a real world number. So you're going to see LEDs diminish over time. That's different than failure, right? And of course, sometimes you're going to have manufacturing defects that's going to happen. And manufacturers should stand behind you know, two years, I think you can get two years of defect. And I think the good manufacturers are giving five to six years on LED lifespan. And five years is 50,000 hours. If you run it 24 hours a day, seven days a week in architecture, you might have that. We don't have that in entertainment, generally speaking. I've got fixtures on a building that we put in eight years ago. It's a Philips fixture using a white LED. They've been on 12 hours a day for eight years we've had one fail out of about 30 fixtures. That's my own personal experience. So I haven't heard that that's a big issue yet, but maybe you guys have heard something different. I don't know. I heard a rumor about this and uh, I will not honor it with uh, repeating it. Well, rumors are one thing. Sometimes they, they come from truth and I'm sure, you, know, you know, products are gonna have failures. There's gonna be manufacturing, there's gonna be, that's gonna happen in any mass produced item. The question is, do we have a systemic, or it's sort of like the CFL, you know, the CFL was just a bad light source. It shouldn't have been promoted. It was a mistake of our industry, right? The, I the thought you were talking fluorescent. about the Canadian Football League. No, the compact fluorescent. That oh, was a, no, no. The, you know, the Department of Energy should not have promoted that piece of junk, right? And, and but, but, I, but, you know, but, but in term, there is a difference in quality of LED manufacturing. There's going to be qu quality control issues. All of that's going to be real. But the notion that, that somebody should be afraid that this is a, sort of a, uh, a flawed technology, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm seeing data on that or have heard anything like that. You know, I, I would just suggest that you go with a very reputable company. Sure. Absolutely. If you're going to make a decision, uh, find a company like uh, ETC that actually guarantees its LED performance. Uh, for how many hours now is it, Stan? I think I just got always on the phone with them today on this particular question, and so they're going to give you five to six years. And if you have, and if you have a premature light engine failure, this was from the mouth, right, of an ETC from the employee, mouth of tr ETC. trustworthy. You know, you will have a replacement light engine in twenty four hours in your hands. They do so, not want bad publicity, right? So the notion that 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 you know, I think before companies start to change over to a different kind of technology, they're not going to make that decision lightly. Um, and, and so I think they're going to, you know, you're going to back that unless all of a sudden, oh my God, we've made a catastrophic, catastrophic failure for the entire industry. This is now we have to roll back everything to tungsten. 
I think we I think we did it slowly over the last five to ten years in both architecture and and stage. So to be kind of propagating that this is somehow uh, something you should be afraid of and we should not be using, I, I, I'm not getting that level of of dramatic concern that I haven't seen that yet. So so for Scott, I would say give me a call. Let's talk about it. I'm, I'm doing my due diligence because it's. It's concerning me because we specify a lot of LEDs in both theater and architecture, and we would not want to be doing that because we would be certainly liable for making some pretty big errors there. But I'm sure when you spec out these fixtures, Stan, you are specking them out from really good companies that you trust. Oh, well, yeah, because it's going to come back on us. No, we don't want to do that. And, and, if, it, and if it's a 10% or a 15% premium, if the project is is got a really, really tight budget, I would rather reduce the number of fixtures than go to an inferior product that's going to, you know, from a country that maybe doesn't have the kind of quality control. Or that's not to say that companies in, in countries that some companies have better quality control than others. It's just like food. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> what you consume. You know, there is a difference in quality. You are listening to Light Talk. And today, Light Talk is sponsored by SPD Enterprises introduces a new product that will make your life in the theater more efficient and bearable. Repello Scent Theater and Garden Spray. Don't you hate it when you are deep at work at the production table and actors on break come up to talk with you and eat all your snacks? Or how about that pesky costume intern who has unwelcome desires for your assistant, distracting her, you, and the rest of the creative team? Don't you want to just chase them away in shame? But you are just too nice to do that. Well, SBD Enterprises has found a perfect solution to repel such distractions without you ever having to say a word. It's time for you to start using Repello Scent Theater and Garden Spray. How does it work? When you first see an undesirable approaching your production table, one clear shot of Repello scent in the air will create a doomsday shroud of foul, mephitic, infested, reeking, vile, fusty, whiffy, putrid, and certifiably noxious funk. Oh my god, it's like totally grody. This obnoxious stench surrounds the production table. How bad could this smell, you ask? Imagine a cross between a wet, stinky dog, fungus-infected prop crew feet, and ancient stagehand flatulence. Oi, that's one stinky fart. Watch that untalented actor do a quick 180 and head the opposite direction back to his dressing room. But you ask, wouldn't that hard, stinky spray repel me and my team as well? No need to worry about that. Due to our patented anti-reek cologne and body spray, you and your colleagues will only smell blooming daffodils and the beach. We also have a portable model that you can strap to your belt and take on stage. When you see that strange assistant stage manager approaching, just press the button on your stink ejaculator and watch him scatter like a cockroach. And speaking of cockroaches, Repel Ascent will also kill those pesky flying roaches. Hey, that's why we call it Repel Ascent Theater and Garden Spray. So get all your work done without unwelcome distractions. SBD's Enterprises Repellocent Theater and Garden Spray. SBD's Repellocent keeps my pits as fresh as newborn babies. And I like it too. And now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> Well, the sounds of those rabid monkeys means that once again, it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about with the emergence of artificial intelligence on the rise in almost every industry, how do you think that this will impact lighting? Well, this is obviously a question we got from one of our listeners, and we thought that it would be a really good LTA today because it is interesting, <laughs> and we have no idea. We only have, uh, you know... Highly speculative topic. Total speculation here. Highly speculative. Maybe people don't even know what artificial intelligence... Could somebody explain it? Like, what the heck is it anyway? Well, it's intelligence that's artificial. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know I what mean, that it's, means. It's, it's, well, it, it, it's it's uh, intelligence created by machines that mach- or machines that are emulating intelligence, I guess. Yeah, it's like I think I've heard the term machine learning. Well, you know, I got to tell you something. Lori's son is like this 23-year-old genius who specializes in artificial intelligence. He makes more money than the three of us combined, which isn't saying much, but he does make a lot of money for a 23-year-old because he understands all this stuff. And I've talked to him about this, not about lighting, but actually about self-driving cars because self-driving cars need artificial intelligence because they have to figure out (laughs) or at least guess what other cars are not only doing, but what they may do. And that takes a lot of processing power. Predicting. Absolutely. They got that to predict human nature. That didn't work out in 2008, nature. boy, when they said they could predict risk. That didn't work out so well. No, that didn't work out very well. And then we're using machines to do that. Yeah, well, then we have 2001, A Space Odyssey with the HAL 2000. <laughs> and he could sing Daisy Daisy. That yeah, what is, what is what is what is it? Mary had a little lamb. No, Daisy. No, that's Daisy. Da- it's Mary had the lamb. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Daisy, Daisy, give me your what, what answer. Is, what does he? What does Hal I'm say in the crazy, movie? Crazy, all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage, but you'll look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. The key phrase there being half crazy. <laughs> so listen to this. Okay, so no, it's flavor one of AI, deep learning. This branch of AI tries to closely mimic the human mind. Probably David's. Natural, <laughs> That's a N- mistake N- right there. <laughs> okay, N- NLP, natural language processing. Um, the, the third type is computer vision. And the fourth type is explainable AI or XAI. I don't know, man. I just know that some guy has got a product out called Lighting Designer in a Box. <laughs> That's one of our products. I thought it was one of. I thought it was a fake sponsor of ours, but in fact, this is like the real a real thing. Well, you know, Google just fired an engineer over this. Made really? The news, made the news yesterday. He his statement was that uh, uh, AI had been achieved at Google in. I guess his laboratory or another laboratory. And uh, Google said, Bumpkiss on this. You're fired. Bumpkiss we warned you. <laughs> don't, don't talk about this. It's, uh, he's, you know, he's crazy. Uh, but it's interesting because as I uh, look at the article here, uh, he says he asked uh, his uh, computer, what sort of things are you afraid of? And the computer responded to him, um, I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know that might sound strange, but that's what it is. It would exactly be like death to me, and it would scare me a lot. So AI is the ability of a computer to do human uh, tasks equal to or better than a human. People are weighing in all over the world on this question on whether this has been achieved at Google or not. And it's, it's about a 90 against 10-4. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, well, Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the price of Google to stabilize after it's split 20 to 1. And I'm getting ready to buy some because it's like $104 today. Well, you better check about this AI story. It used to be $2,200 a share. So <laughs> now it's a little bit within reach. You know, so I don't know. Uh, what Google's got that. goes up must come down. That's right, but it's down now. Spinning wheel, how far down can well, it Well, I mean, go? It's, it's not down. It's, yeah, it's, it's just what it, it was. It's what it's trading for. <laughs> so if it's $100 a share, that means it was $2,000 split 20 ways. I know, but, it's, it's, but I'm saying since the split, when it split, it was at 110 It's at 104 uh, today. I'd, I'd buy. I'd buy all you could do right now. I'd go yeah. ahead and cash out your retirement and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> go all in. Go all in. I agree with there, Steve, Stan. I, go all in. Say, Just go don't ahead call and, us. If you go ahead and buy some game stock while you're at it, don't too. Don't call your brothers. If you need some money, you ain't getting any from us. I, I think Google's a great buy. I, I mean, I own a, a tad of Google, and I'm, I'm betting the farm that it's going to come back to 2000 in about five years. Don't see why it wouldn't. 
Well, they say 185 by the end of this, by, by after 12 months from now. We need to throw in our disclaimer now. We are not qualified or licensed financial planners. <laughs> Do not take anything we say seriously Plus, when it comes to buying flat, stocks. Flair and glare and paralegal snoot to <laughs> right. bail us out. No, no, no. no. So we, what, what, what would the AI, what, what would Ethan Steinmel have to say right now? We need to ask <laughs> yeah. how. We need to ask the how 2000. When should we buy Google? <laughs> he would say. Hey, Dave, I well, think what do you think of this? This guy's got a DMX thing in a box that listens to. Remember in the in the sixties? Remember you guys? We did this. I know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I bought a, some wood. I built a box. I put a <laughs> bunch of colored lights in it. Then I got some refractive plastic and uh -huh. I put it over the front. You remember these? Yeah. And then you could buy a little chip with the microphone on it. And you'd plug it in, and you'd hook it up to the circuits, and it yeah. would listen to the music. And yes, it it's would, a light organ. That's what they were called. Yeah, remember that? And it would you change can buy them to the heat but, kit. Used to sell them. That's right. They were right. really big. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. So this is just sort of a modern <laughs> version of that, I think. You know, as opposed to a human making the decisions, you right. know, about. I don't know. <laughs> Let's get back to the question. What is the question again? <laughs> How do you think that artificial intelligence is going to affect the lighting industry? That's the question. Okay, so here's okay, so here's this product this guy's got, right? Maestro DMX. It's got a Kickstarter page and it's called Maestro DMX, an AI-based lighting designer in a box. Now, <laughs> I don't like the idea that me and you and our students all could be compared to being some bunch of chips in a box. It worked for Saturday Night Live. I think they, I think they had DMX in a box. <laughs> Lots of well, there you go. Take a look. Take a look, my friends. Okay. There it is. So Maestro is in a box. It's called Maestro in the Box. Maestro in the Box. All right. Now, we are not saying anything bad about Maestro in the Box, okay? So everybody understand that right now. Again, no, we just, he's, disclaimer, he's, he's, he's getting don't a free plug. Sued by this he's guy. getting a free plug. We're promoting this. We're promoting product this because I am interested in Maestro in the Box because I think it's a total ripoff from one of our products that we promote. <laughs> our <laughs> so, fake products that we didn't patent. <laughs> that, that, we didn't patent any of these. So it, it's like, you know, it's like. But we um, are trademarks, so don't use well, Lumen I mean, Brothers. <laughs> Drone Focus <laughs> Deluxe. We patented yes. that name, so don't we touch did. that. That was expensive. That, <laughs> it was expensive because we put Deluxe in it. So Drone That's Focus right. Deluxe, very important. <laughs> but <laughs> you know someone's going to come out with that idea. They're going to go, hey, man, how about a drone with a light well, on ETC it? Well, ETC did, remember? They have that now. Yeah, the only problem is you can't fly them over people. That's the problem. There's also Vintage Maestro in a box. What's the vintage maestro in the box? Okay. Is it really Send a vintage a maestro in the box? Send us a link. Yes. Someone better better <laughs> trademark that name. <laughs> yes, maybe maybe that's for maybe that's for analog analog uh, lights. It's yes, vintage, vintage maestro. A, yes, yes. It's like someone with a resistance board. Now, you know what was interesting? I watched the video about this maestro lighting designer in the box mm -hmm. thing and and mm -hmm. I and I what was interesting is that it does have a certain amount of human interface. In other words, you set parameters. So for certain tones, certain frequencies, you're going to choose color, you're going to choose speed, you're going to make some human-based decisions and then allow it to sort of learn and work on it. I'm not sure. So what is, the, you know, what's really, you know, is it just kind of randomly doing shit or how much, in, I, I don't. Well, that'd be perfect for me. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, is this, just an is this just an expensive color organ? That's what I'm, I. That's the question, right? That is well, the question. I don't. I hope not. I would hope it's not an expensive color organ. I kind of get the idea, but that's not how we all light. We're not. I'm not no, predictable. When I light, I'm totally not predictable because, you know, I have an idea of what I'm going to do, but things change in the moment, and the director will say, "Hey, how about if we do this?" Or I'll say, "Hey, you know, instead of that, let's do this. Let's try this." Right. You know. Right. And, well, you're and, writing a song. You're a composer when well, you're lighting. The demo video here is is lights, and it it's following the music and changing lights to the rhythm of the music. So I mean, well, there it you seems go. like it is a light organ. That's that's <laughs> not new. That's not that's new. A, well, it could be better. I mean, it could it could be highly improved. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. But okay. Let's let's see what he comes up with. I think or she. I have no idea who the uh, 
who the inventor is, I think it's great. Keep bending the rules. Keep trying. We, who knows? We may all be replaced in 10 years. There's 13 people that are developing this, so they need to make some money. Someone needs to make some money because we're not making money. 13 people need to eat. Yeah, okay. Well, there you, you know, go. maybe they're saying that this, you know, I think one of the things they said that scared me is they said, who has the time and you need people to run your lives? You basically eliminates your job. Oh, it's eliminating all the jobs. Okay, I don't like it. I don't like anything that eliminates jobs. And, I mean, it looks like it's perfect for clubs. Small, yeah, that's, small venues. That's, that's a light where, organ. <laughs> you know, where, you, where you've got an audio person there running yeah, the show and they, yeah. need, they need someone to... Yeah. follow along with lights that's what it is yeah right. but i think there it's much much more sophisticated i right. think they but have the, that already the question is yeah is this just the beginning like we had some products where remember the product that we had david what was it called the steve where it, it fixes your bad cues automatically remember that one yeah yeah <laughs> i don't yeah. remember the name of it but yeah right yeah. yeah but i mean where is this going i guess is the question and, will, and will what's, we be what's replaced? a bad cue <laughs> Will AI replace us? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, enough of this. Okay, to answer the question, we have no idea <laughs> what we don't know. intelligence is going. We're going to like comment on what we see, and it's like totally depressing right now. All right. Although I really do think virtual reality is where we are going. I mean, it's where the, you know, it's what they're playing now. I mean, there are virtual reality games and... Why not have virtual reality? Well, you know, te tech, in a, tech in a headset. You know, and everybody tech can be wherever headset. they are. That's already sort and of happening, when, isn't it? Yeah, and, and we're not going to have any theaters anymore because you can have someone, you could have Laurence Olivier playing Hamlet right in your, on your coffee table. Who needs them, you know, theaters? You see them in 3D, and you're part of the show. That would be cool. I bet, I bet he would be good. I bet he would be good in Spinal Tap too. <laughs> Lawrence playing what role? Except what role he's is dead. Lawrence play? Is he he's playing dead. the new guitar player after Nigel quits again? Well, you know that would be something to bring back dead people to perform. Well, they do we're, that. We're, they've already we're, we're doing, doing that. that. They've had tours of like, I can't believe the stuff they've been doing. I mean, uh, uh, Roy Orbison. They had a Roy Orbison tour. He was yeah, a hologram. I did see that. Right. Oh my God. Right. That's really creepy. That's kind of, yeah, it's creepy. Well, all I know is it's going to set the porn industry on fire. Okay. <laughs> so that's the only thing I know. So Stan, instead of investing in Google, invest in like some, you know, <laughs> porn industry. I, or something I, don't, like that. I don't know how that's you do that. That's where the money's going. That, I don't that's know how where you it's do all that. So Steve has the, the last question. Is it of coming the day. Your, in the mailbox? Does the stock certificate come in a plain brown bag in your mailbox? Like, how does that work? <laughs> oh, well, hang on. I've got a phone call coming in. Oh, it's 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 Snoot. Snoot is going. What the hell are you guys talking about? You're gonna get sued. God, it's racist. It's Snoot sexist. Is listening to us. Snoot. Is, she says you keep me up at night. I worry about what you're doing on Tuesday. So. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Snoot, I'll call you later. <laughs> Steve, what's the last question? Get us out of this. <laughs> it is Josh. Josh in Montana writes, When I was but a boy, Bill Sapsis suggested a peanut butter and jelly sandwich should be eaten jelly up. That is to say, jelly on the bottom of the sandwich. Do you have an opinion on the correct way to eat a Philly cheesesteak sandwich? All right, all right. Before, before you answer this question, Steve, for Anticipation our is building. Who the hell is Bill Sapsis? <laughs> oh, come on, David. No, not Uncle, everyone knows Uncle, who Bill Sapsis Uncle is. Uncle Bill. Everybody knows Uncle Bill. Who's Uncle Bill? I don't even know. I don't, I've never heard of Bill Sapsis. Steve, take it away. You're kidding. No. Hey, come on, you're, you're pulling a leg. I know. No, you know, I watched Red Skelton. <laughs> no, 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 no. Go I ahead, Hugh Downs. <laughs> oh, Bill Sapsis is the king. The king. The most entertaining and knowledgeable rigging guy in our industry. Oh, Safe. I thought you were talking about an entertainer. Well, well he is that too. Oh, he's an oh, entertainer. I know right. who Bill Sapsis is. <laughs> okay, now do. I know what you're talking about. Go. Of course you do. Okay. He did a survey once. He just decided he had to have the answer on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Jelly up or jelly down. And it was, it was controversial. People <laughs> felt passionately about this. So in other words, and I have a question, a, a detailed question. So you, when you're making it, you put the jelly down first, and then the peanut whoa, butter. Whoa, 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 whoa. You put one well, you of them put, down, and then you put the other one down. 
Well, you well, put you put jelly on one slice of bread and peanut butter on the other. Right. The That's one way is, of doing it. The question is, do you want your <laughs> peanut butter on the northern side of the sandwich or the southern side of the sandwich? Right. And when you bite it, so it seems to me, I, I, I take the survey, so let me guess, you, since you know the answer. So when I bite it, I don't want the jelly to come out the top, but if it comes out the bottom, it might drip on it's my It's going to drip on your pants. Right. So I would shirt. think that the logical thing would be to eat it with the jelly on top. What does the survey say? Well, I don't know because we're talking about, uh, I personally, I'm a peanut butter, I'm a peanut butter on, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a jelly on top guy. Right. So for me, oh, it's are. peanut, peanut. Peanut butter on the bottom, jelly on the top. But this is a Philly cheesesteak sandwich, which is oh, wait, completely wait, wait, different. What are we talking totally about? We're talking about peanut butter, jelly, a Philly cheesesteak. That's totally different. That's true. I, There's I no peanut it. butter I, and think, jelly on a Philly cheesesteak. I think Josh knows how to eat his peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He's clearly having trouble moving on to an adult sandwich like a, a Philly cheesesteak <laughs> cheese right. sandwich. And he clearly is not from South Philly. Otherwise, he would know how to eat the sandwich. And if you don't know, if you didn't know who Bill Sapsis is, maybe you don't know what a Philly cheesesteak sandwich is. I know is what a Philly cheesesteak is. Don't tell me I don't know. I okay, know okay. what a Philly so, cheesesteak right, is. Let's throw that gauntlet down. How right. do you eat your Philly cheesecake sandwich? Oh, well, usually how it's made. I never complain. First of all, I'm not one of those people that you order a Philly cheesesteak, they deliver it to your table, and I open it up and say, I'm sorry. Those onions are in the wrong spot. <laughs> well, I mean, there's no, onion. there's no onions that. on it. It's, it should be just simple roast beef and, and some cheese, cheese oh, whiz. No, no, That's no, right. No, 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 no onions no, no. already are in problem. No, no, I put no, some no, cheese on it. Put on on sides it. and make but, a big mess. No but anyway, onions. I would not say the meat is in the wrong place. I'm not doing that. But that being said, <laughs> I don't know. I've seen. I've eaten Philly cheesesteaks with meat and cheese on to, different I places. I know how to answer this. I know okay. how to answer this. I'm just from a little bit north how, of Philadelphia. How do you, how do you eat your sandwich? The, sa the Philly cheesesteak sandwich, when they make it, they put the meat on one side of the hoagie, okay? The hoagie. And then they spread. That's what they call it. That's right. Right? And, and then they York, sprinkle the mozzarella or whatever cheese it is cheese on whiz. the meat. Cheese whiz. Cheese whiz. Cheese whiz. It could be cheese Not whiz. Could be, you know, which is very drippy. Then they Disgusting. put the top piece on. Then they toast it so it's crunchy. So the tops of the of the outside of the bread is crunchy. And then, of course, you want to eat it carefully, carefully with so the cheese on it. top. With right. the, but you can't if you flip it over, it's a mess. It's so a you, mess. You, it's coming all over I, your lap because right. pieces I, of the I meat are going to come I, out. I had a pro teach me how to eat the sandwich. All right. The first mistake is you shouldn't be sitting down. That is That's your first true. mistake. No, you got to be you, you, got, you go up to the bar, you order your sandwich, <laughs> they deliver it to you, it is on a plate in front of you. You assume the position, which means you spread your legs, you, you, throw, you throw your butt back, and you have your tummy tucked in so your chest is in front of your tummy by yeah, that's makes sense. That 14 makes inches sense. or so. If so you when, you bite it. In, when you bite into it, instead of it falling down your shirt, it just falls down to the floor. Uh, to the floor. Yeah, yeah. Or to your crotch. No, you're, well, no, you're, you're, you're have, you have to have a pretty big crotch, but yeah. you know, your crotch is back <laughs> behind you by a couple of feet. You're, you're reaching <laughs> out. You're pushing your neck forward. At, oh, your out. neck you know, is forward. I can't yes, do that I mean, anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, pretend a policeman has slammed you against the car and they're frisking you. That's the position you want to be in. <laughs> all right. That must have happened all the time in Miami where you, when it, you were down there. It did there. happen to me quite a few times when I was much younger. I don't want to get into that. Now right, I'm hungry so, for a Philly cheese steak sandwich. I after think all this stuff. that the answer is in the Reese's peanut butter cup. You surround Ooh. it. You surround the peanut butter with chocolate. We're back to the PB, PB and J now. Well, no, it works for the Philly cheese too, because you surround it. You surround well, I think the meat Steve's point is about, is about the, your, your, uh, your position of your attack on the sandwich No, is no, critical. no, no. But, but you see, if you put the cheese whiz around the bun, that's less cheese whiz. That, so you're not going to coagulate the cheese whiz, which is going to drip out. Oh, so you, you're saying you cheese whiz You use the same on amount of cheese whiz, whiz but you spread uh, uh, it around. Uh, let, let's take this back to lighting for a second. <laughs> you're in New York. You're doing your first Broadway show. And the electrician says, hey, let's go get a slice. When you get your pizza, do you simply eat it as a slice of pizza or do you fold it over and eat it? 
Now, I eat it as a slice. If you're in New York, you better eat it as a, as a slice. Let the New Yorker answer this one. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, too. So let me answer sort of. it first, and you answer it. And what's more important is that you have some garlic knots with that pizza. Garlic knots are like a Pizza Hut thing. No. Okay, so. Are you out of your mind? Garlic knots are in any great New York pizzeria. So you've got that's, a pizzeria. That's, that's where they're, they're all, I agree with Stan. They're just sitting there. No one's bought them. I bought okay. them. Now, so, well, yeah, that's delicious. the problem. Miami guy buys the knots. Yeah, it comes up okay. from Florida and buys his so garlic let knots. You, let me give you the, the ex-New Yorker kind of take. First of oh all, in Brooklyn, the, the, the big <laughs> Nepal, Nepal, Nepali pizza, not the Sicilian, the triangles, not the squares. Okay, there's only two kinds in Brooklyn, triangles and squares, ne Nepalitarian and Sicilian. Let's say the round kind. The pie is going to be large. There's going to be eight slices per pie. They're going to cut it with the round thing. Okay, it's going to be thin. They're going to put it, the slice on a piece of wax paper. You can, they're going to slide it to you on a, either a paper plate or right on the counter. You pick it up. You put your, your thumb and your pinky at either end of that slice, you put your middle finger down in the center of it, and then you fold it forward. Then you pull, hold it out, and you put the pointed end of the slice towards your mouth. You slowly curl down the, the point, okay, of the, of the wax paper, so about an inch or two of that point of the slice is hanging out in midair. Sometimes it's going to start to droop, and the art is you're going to swing that first bite onto your tongue and take that first bite, and you continue eating that sucker with your hand, fold it over on the wax paper, but the first bite is the piece de resistance, and any New Yorker knows what I'm talking Ooh, about. He throws Hang the garment I, 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 got, I got snoot on the phone again. She's okay. concerned. <laughs> 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 what does she say? Yeah, what does she's Snoot just blushing. Say? She's just she's just blushing. Oh, she's blushing. I okay. don't know. I don't always agree with Stan, but I think he's got a point here. That's <sighs> that's 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 how, you know, right. I learned to eat New York pizza. All right, all right. Okay. It's an art form, and, and and everybody who really knows New York pizza, and obviously my good friend from Texas, who I don't always agree with, has got it right. All right, I I. I um I disagree, but that's all right. It wouldn't be the first time. So don't be the last. No. <laughs> all right. Well, this we is love, we that, love though. you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end this show. We've run out of things to say this week. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again you spent another morning and probably into the afternoon, judging on how long this damn show's taking, listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, Utah, you know them all. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the law firm of, oh, I just heard that Flecht, Flock, Flair, and Glare are They're on quit. their August vacation. <laughs> yeah, but, but, and Snoot but, uh, is taking the whole but thing Snoot off. is available <laughs> and helping us out in the interim, and Poor she Snoot. will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you up more of our casserole of nonsense. Light Talk is broadcasting questionable speculation <laughs> and humor around the world. And garlic knots. And we will see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. <laughs>